and so uh, both uh, Professor Macbeth and Professor uh, Davies have set the stage uh, very nicely for uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about today. Um, my group is uh, very interested in the idea of putting together uh, molecules, complex molecules, and certainly to do that, we need all the types of tools that uh, Professor Davies and um, Macbeth have discussed here today. But when I was asked to put together a talk today, especially one that is geared toward an undergraduate audience, um, I was a bit struck because Professor Davy said, you know, Richmond think about a talk broadly uh, on organic synthesis. And so if we want to talk about organic synthesis, the question is, where do we start? And I think that's a good question. And for me, uh, when I think about organic synthesis, it always takes me back to the sort of philosophical uh, conversations that were happening, uh, you know, before the common era. And so during the time of Plato and Aristotle and others, um, and this is sort of represented here in this uh, fresco by Raphael in the Athens school, there's a lot of discussions about what organic was, right? And so people thought of inorganic, first of all, as, uh, you know, inorganic matter, especially as matter that could be melted and restored. So once you cooled it down, it came back to its original form. Whereas with organic compounds, when you heated them, they transformed, right? And they could not be restored. And the difference at the time is that people thought of organic compounds containing what they called a vital force, right? That led to the vitality of living systems. And this was only present in organic compounds. And so there were lots of uh, sort of hypotheses that were ultimately uh, discounted on the basis of experiment. And one of those happened to be this idea of phlogiston, right? Which goes back to this sort of vitality argument of this ephemeral uh, existence, uh, which had to be discovered. And so people looked for this phlogiston. This goes all the way back to the early 1600s and people like Stahl who uh, worked on these ideas. And that ultimately, you know, pursuit of phlogiston led to the discovery of the gases, right? Like oxygen, and ultimately combustion arose out of that uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so you can sort of track the arc of, of organic synthesis through these early discoveries. And in my opinion, uh, this work uh, by Friedrich Bohler in the 1800s really marks the beginning of organic synthesis for me. And Bohler happened to be a medical doctor and had studied medicine at Heidelberg. Um, but was very interested in chemistry and in fact taught chemistry. And what Voller did was disprove this vital force theory. And he did that in a famous way. And so Voller uh, accidentally discovered uh, urea. And this arose from considering at the time ammonium cyanate, which was viewed as an inorganic material. And when Voller heated ammonium cyanate, this was transformed first to an isocyanate and ammonia through a proton transfer. And then the ammonia engaged the isocyanate to form urea. And as Bowler stated in a communication with his teacher, Berzelius, who was in fact a believer in vitalism, Bowler talks about how one can then convert an inorganic material to an organic material and said that sort of tongue in cheek, right? Because urea, of course, is contained in our chemical waters, right? Um, and talked about the fact that he could make urea without needing kidneys, right? And that it did not necessarily arise from a human or animal. And so in that sense, that really launched the idea of organic synthesis and being able to prepare materials that are carbon based, right, but laced with the quality of nitrogen and oxygen and other heteroatoms uh, in the laboratory setting. And so if one then tracks the sort of history of organic synthesis by looking at complex molecules and our ability to build complexity, you can see that the field has come a long way since the time of Voller. 
And so through these molecules, you can track that there's a lot of complexity that we can now achieve as we look to build molecules. And a lot of that complexity has arisen because of the power of the types of methods that Professor Davies talked about and Professor Macbeth talked about. But one thing you will notice with a lot of these molecules is that they all contain functional groups. So oxygens and nitrogens and perhaps halogens, right? And these are all important in terms of the function of these molecules, but they also enable us to prepare these molecules by thinking about their functionality. So here I wanted to illustrate this with an example. So this is a relatively old example in terms of when the synthesis of these molecules uh, were, were achieved. Um, but this compound brevitoxin is, in my opinion, a dauntingly complex molecule. But if you now think about the types of heteroatoms that you have in this molecule, and especially the oxygen heteroatoms, you could see how this molecule could, for instance, be stitched together by using oxygen to stitch it together. And so if by the same token, one excises the oxygens, you can take this back by breaking the carbon oxygen bonds to something that looks relatively simpler, right? Um, and this is a hallmark of strategically how we think about building complex molecules. So we look to take the complex molecules back by effecting the sort of intellectual disconnection back to a simpler precursor through what is termed retrosynthetic analysis. And so for the undergraduates, if you've taken a course in organic chemistry, you've more than likely talked about retrosynthetic analysis. But that is mostly based on thinking about heteroatom chemistry or functional group chemistry, where we can disconnect bonds about where the functional groups would tell us to disconnect the bonds. And as Professor Davies shared with us in thinking about expanding retrosynthesis, right? And so here I provide an example in the context of how one would build a chair. We think about building this chair first in the Ikea way by an exploded diagram, right? So if you bought this chair from Ikea, it will come to you as its constituent parts, which you would have to put together. And so the idea of retrosynthesis is taking this chair back to its constituent parts and then where we linch this together, where we connect these together, those are in principle, our functional groups, right? So the functional groups kind of mark places where we'll have reactivity to bring this together. But the idea behind CH functionalization is that can we eschew this traditional functional groups and think beyond these, where we can start to put this together simply from, you know, two by fours, for instance, right? Where we don't have the holes already drilled to put this together. And so in a chemical sense, uh, what this means is that we break away from the sort of restrictions and constraints of functional groups. So traditionally, for example, if you wanted to functionalize the CH bond, you would do that proximal to a functional group like a carbonyl that would enable one to form the enolate. And then you could install some electrophile, right? But as we've learned today from Pro Professor Davies and from Professor Macbeth, through the CCHF and other developments in CH functionalization, we can move beyond this, right? Where we can now start to form carbon-carbon bonds to positions that are distal from other functional groups on the starting substrate. And so here are some examples that Professor Davies and Professor Macbeth talked about today. And so in the field of complex molecule synthesis, people have really looked to take advantage of this idea, which breaks away from the traditional functional groups. And so on this slide, I show some examples. And so Professor Davies also talked about this idea of the hoffman leffler freytag reaction, right? Where now we would like to form a carbon nitrogen bond to this methyl group on a steroid derivative but we don't need to have a functional group here. So this hydrogen that we're going to functionalize, this is distal to any other functional groups on the steroid, right? And so using this hoffman leffler freytag reaction that Professor Davies talked about, one can now stitch together this pyrrolidine ring to make this five-membered ring. Here's another cool way to put together a carbon-carbon bond where in forming a cyclopropane from this 
double bond, one can arrive at a carbene. And so again, today we heard about carbenes and these are powerfully reactive groups. But if they are proximal to a CH bond, you can use those carbenes to affect a CC bond formation. Okay, so there's a famous example uh, that illustrates that idea. And this is an example that is even closer to home in terms of our center, where one, as opposed to generating a carbene, can generate the nitrogen sort of analogous reactive intermediate, a nitrine or some equivalent thereof. And so this was work that was done by Professor Dubois' laboratory. And Professor Dubois is another uh, very important participant in the Center for CH Functionalization. And so using these conditions, one can arrive at a metal nitrine equivalent, a rhodium nitrine equivalent, and that in turn can insert into a CH bond. And so in that way, you can forge a new type of carbon nitrogen bond. And then another famous example uh, in CH functionalization chemistry, one can take alkanes or some alkane derivatives. And so Professor Davies again talked about alkanes today. And you can essentially dehydrogenate the alkane to arrive at an alkene. And that in turn could be utilized to make a complex molecule. And so this was work that was done by Professor Dalibor Samish's laboratory. And in fact, my understanding here is that Professor Eric Sorensen, who was in our center, was important in some of the early discussions that then ultimately led to this chemistry. So what I would like you to take away from this slide is that we don't have to be bound by having the CH bonds be proximal to functional groups in order to carry out the functionalization of those CH bonds to make complex molecules. But by the same token, because a lot of complex molecules and especially natural products have functional groups that imbue them with interesting function, perhaps there are opportunities to take advantage of those functional groups that are already present in those complex natural products to forge new types of bonds. And so these were some of the lessons that we wanted to bring to building complex molecules and especially natural products. And so in at one sense, you can think about a lot of the early developments in terms of complex molecule synthesis involving directing groups that are innate in the complex target that one would like to make, all right? But ultimately it would be really great to be able to functionalize any position at will as we started to learn from what Professor Davies and Professor Macbeth presented today. And so here was our charge when we became a part of the CCHF. We were interested in making complex molecules such as the ones that I show here. And we were interested in building these molecules by taking advantage of CH functionalization methods to forge different types of bonds. And so for example, in these two cases, I've highlighted the bonds where we thought there might be opportunities to functionalize CH bonds that were distal from functional groups in order to put these molecules together. We were also interested in functionalizing other CH bonds. So for example, on aromatic ring systems. So in, in this case, on a pyridine, uh, which will be an example of a pi deficient aromatic ring system. Um, and so in that case, we were able to site selectively uh, uh, install a functional grouping that enabled us to forge this bond in red. Or we could also think about functionalizing pi excessive rings. So in this case, uh, you can think of this an indole functional uh, uh, grouping uh, where we could site selectively install a halogen and then take advantage of that to ultimately install other heterocycles. So if we look at these types of CH functionalization reactions here, we're functionalizing on the periphery of the systems uh, that we were looking at. So we were looking at this left-hand piece in this case and a right-hand piece, and we're functionalizing those on the periphery in order to form the CC bond. And here we started with the precursor lacking the halogen. And so we're functionalizing it site selectively on the periphery. Whereas in these cases, the functionalizations ultimately led 
to put in together forging the core frameworks of these molecules. And so I would call those core functionalizations. And you'll notice in these two core functionalizations, we were forming carbon nitrogen bonds. And what we came to realize early on is that this direct carbon nitrogen bond formation, very much akin to the Huffman Left Lefraytag reaction, was a powerful way to start to make alkaloid molecules, alkaloid uh, natural products. And so I wanted to tell you about one particular example in this space uh, with regard to making compounds such as herb indole B. And so herb indole B is an example of a natural product um, that is found in a larger class of natural products. These were isolated by Robert Capon's laboratories. So people actually have the pleasure of diving in, in the oceans and isolating uh, these types of molecules. And so Capon and Schur um, isolated several of these molecules and characterize the compounds. And you know, one thing that we found interesting about this family of natural products, which you might notice here, is that if you look at this compound that I'm circling and this compound here, they're actually sort of like enantiomers, okay? Save for the fact that this one contains a methyl group and this one contains a hydrogen. So they're pseudo enantiomers. Right, And so as we started to think about how to build these molecules, we wondered, wouldn't it be nice to be able to build not only one, but both enantiomer uh, from a common precursor? And so if you start to think about building enantiomeric molecules, then perhaps a common precursor for that could be a meso precursor, where you could break that meso symmetry and essentially uh, diverge into the different enantiomeric series. And so we thought that these types of molecules could arise from a precursor like this, which in turn could arise from this meso precursor. Okay, so here's our retrosynthetic analysis and that in turn could arise from these three different types of components. Okay, carbon monoxide, an alkyne and this alkene which we could stitch together to build this meso compound. And that in turn could be parlayed to arrive at this aniline compound. And so the key for this retrosynthetic analysis rested on our ability to now use a CH functionalization reaction to form a carbon nitrogen bond to this terminal methyl group, which is distal from any of the other functionality, but perhaps we could take advantage of this nitrogen to force that carbon nitrogen bond. And that nitrogen is innate in the types of products that we were trying to make, all right? But we had to be able to develop the right type of oxidative CN bond to enable us to form this carbon nitrogen bond. And I have to tell you that bond did not exist. That type of bond forming reaction did not exist when we started this work. But therein lies the power of the center. So how are we going to be able to make this type of carbon nitrogen bond? And to our rescue came Professor Jin Kwon Yu. All right, and so Professor Jin Kwon Yu, as we've heard also from Professor uh, Davies and, uh, and Macbeth is a, an important player in our center. And Professor Yu and his coworkers had developed an interesting reaction. The reaction they had developed was to take this particular starting material, and you can see that also bears a nitrogen that has now been derivatized. And if you expose this to the right catalyst, right? And Professor Macbeth talks about these different types of catalysts, and Professor Davies did as well. In this particular case, a palladium catalyst, you could coax this uh, triflamid, okay, to now direct a functionalization on this methyl group. And that ultimately leads to a palladium carbon bond. And that palladium carbon bond, and again, Professor Davies talked about some uh, variants of this, okay? But this carbon palladium bond sets the stage for a Suzuki type cross coupling, okay? And that leads to the formation of this carbon carbon bond. And so that was beautiful chemistry that Professor Yu's laboratory had developed. And we wondered whether we could take advantage of some of the lessons that have been learned there 
to enable us to make this carbon nitrogen bond that is found in the types of natural products that we wanted to make. So the idea was simple. Could we take a precursor like this, okay, related to the ones that Professor Yu's laboratory had looked at and effect a conversion of this carbon hydrogen bond to a carbon palladium bond. And in this case, in the absence of a boronic acid or ester derivative, could we now coax this to form the carbon nitrogen bond through what is termed a reductive elimination, okay? And that would then lead us to uh, this endoline, okay? Which looks like what we would like in terms of where we were trying to go. But the beauty of organic synthesis and all the mechanistic studies and the computations that Professor Macbeth talked about is that there are often multiple hypotheses about how things will proceed. And one has to infer from the empirical data that you get, uh, which of those hypotheses can be supported. Okay, and so there were several mechanistic hypotheses that we had to consider. So what I told you on the left is that we were interested in having this terminal CH bond uh, activated by virtue of forming a carbon palladium bond. But if you will recall from the initial work from Professor Yu's laboratory, the CH bonds that have been activated were special in the sense that they were benzylic, okay? And so it's also possible in our system that actually a benzylic CH functionalization was activation was what actually ensued initially. And that ultimately we could see a pathway that that could ultimately also lead to the types of products that we were interested in arriving at, okay? Um, so a very interesting mechanistic picture unfolded and we've looked into that as well. But the beauty of this particular uh, uh, hypothesis that we had about this chemistry and applying uh, what Professor Yu's laboratory had developed is that it works, okay? And so we could take the conditions with some uh, uh, optimization of those conditions working closely uh, with Professor Yu's laboratory, we could take the conditions and in fact, forged the carbon nitrogen bond. And under the conditions, not only did the carbon nitrogen bond form, but we also got an additional dehydrogenation to arrive at an endole, uh, which is exactly what we wanted in terms of uh, making the types of natural products that we were interested in. And some of this work, some of this early work was done by an undergraduate working along with graduate students in our laboratory. And this undergraduate had come to our laboratory as part of the CCHF summer program. So Chris McAtee was from Lycoming College and joined our laboratory for the summer and participated in this work. And so the CCHF has this very powerful program that enables undergraduates from elsewhere uh, to come to a CCHF lab often during the summers. And so we've applied this chemistry not only to the substrates that contain that methyl group, but also those that lack the methyl group and the chemistry works in both cases. And following some earlier precedent from Mike Kerr's laboratory, we could advance these two indole derivatives to the natural products of interest to us. And so the Kerr laboratory has shown that that could be done in an earlier paper. All right, so that's one story that I wanted to share with you in terms of how we're thinking about employing CH functionalization and building complex molecules. So we're bringing together sort of the strategies of synthesis together with the powerful methods um, that are afforded by CH functionalization, which breaks us away from the constraints of the traditional functional group. And so I will end by saying the CH functionalization is a highly enabling, uh, powerful, uh, a way to now start to think about disconnections in organic chemistry. In my laboratory, we've applied this liberally and, uh, and joyfully to a whole range of different molecules. Um, I show examples of the types of molecules that my laboratory has made here. Some of these were applied CH functionalization uh, technology to make, others we did not. So if I was going to leave you with a quiz, as I do in my sophomore organic classes, the quiz would be, which of these molecules do you think we made by employing CH functionalization and which ones we did not employ CH functionalization in making. And for the ones where we did not employ CH functionalization in making, can you now think about breaking us away from the constraints of the traditional functional group and think about how we could perhaps improve the synthesis um, by using CH functionalization? And once you do figure that out, please contact me because we would love 
to do away with the maze of the traditional functional group and how we have to navigate that to a more direct way of doing this through CH functionalization. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. Again, very excited to be a part of the center of the CH functionalization. I think it's really a powerful way to think about making molecules. I am lucky to work with a diverse, very talented group of people at Berkeley um, and also in the center for CH functionalization as shown here. Uh, we really pride ourselves in, in many, uh, many characteristics, which I think makes for excellent scientists, um, some of which are listed here, which I borrowed from this particular uh, paper here. So again, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be a part of this inaugural uh, undergraduate symposium, uh, Hugh and uh, the rest of the CCHF. And for those listening, thank you for your attention. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.